Welcome to another exciting episode of KevJet, the podcast. I'm thrilled to introduce this week's guest, the one and only Nancy Reagan. Our podcast, The Canadian Love Map, is all about love of all kinds. So um, including your love relationship with the Gigi's, the Golden Girls, definitely, which your listeners probably know all about now. Nancy is just not a TV presenter, but also a talented actor, author, and all-around amazing person. She brings her captivating personality and wealth of knowledge to every project she takes on. They don't just want to meet them, <laughs> Kev. Uh, they want to be them. <laughs> so I want to be one of them. In today's episode, we deep dive into Nancy's fascinating world, discussing everything from her experiences as a TV presenter to her incredible acting career. But that's not all. Brace yourselves for some juicy secrets. We'll uncover Nancy's secret crush on Barbie's very own Ken. Yes, you've heard it here first. Oh, um, you did say this was going to be unfiltered. It is unfiltered. So sit back, relax, and get comfortable as Nancy joins us to share her stories, insights, and perhaps some unexpected revelations. It's going to be a fun-filled and enlightening conversation that you won't want to miss. Get ready, fellow listeners, for another great episode of KevJet, the podcast, with our very special guest, Nancy Regan. Let's dive in. Hello, Nancy. Hi, Jet. How are oh, you? Oh, I'm trying that out. I'm just trying that out. <laughs> and I have to I have to explain that this week you announced that we were good enough friends now that I could call you what your friends call you, which is Jet instead of Kevin. Definitely. When I hear Kevin, I think, oh my gosh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> you are not in trouble. You good. are in the opposite of trouble right now because I'm so grateful to be here and also just kind of excited to have this conversation. Yeah, so am I. I'm so thrilled that you agreed to come on and uh, and to have this conversation. Definitely. It's lovely. To oh, you really had to twist my arm. And I can actually see you. So the listeners can't see you, but I can, which is lovely. Yeah, I think it's lovely that you invited me on as a guest on this fabulous new podcast. Uh, I've sort of been on this ride from the beginning when you said, I think I'm going to do a podcast. And maybe even... Before that, on the ride, definitely. How did this podcast come to be? Let's talk about that. <laughs> well, I think it it kind of. I think you kind of put a seed in my brain when uh, you asked us to be a guest on your show, The Canadian Love Map, which was a great experience. We didn't know what to expect, um, and it's something that everybody talks about when they see us now. Um, and Isn't they, that funny? Yeah, they've just loved it. And uh, I think the Canadian love map has taken over in England now. Ah, oh, well, that's good news. <laughs> I, I, we obviously chose our guests well. <laughs> <laughs> no, you and Nick were fantastic. And I, I think, uh, you know, your authenticity and your sense of fun and your clear love for each other came through. And our podcast, the Canadian love map is all about love of all kinds. So um, including your love relationship with the Gigi's, the Golden yeah, Girls, definitely, which your listeners probably know all about now, that was another uh, beautiful aspect. It's like another layer of our conversation. It is. And um, that's something that uh, new people come up to me and say, uh, oh my gosh, I love the story of the Gigi's and I, I need to meet them, that everybody wants to meet them. <laughs> They don't just want to meet them, Kev. Uh, they want to be them. So I want to be one of them. I want to audition. I want to come to the UK. My little sister lives there. And I want to come visit you and, you know, have an audition to be a golden girl. Definitely. I've got well, the silver hair for it. <laughs> there you go. Um, we had dinner um, a couple of weeks ago and we had a talk about the podcast. Um, we talked about how we met. Everyone has a little bit of a different version um, cause it was, <laughs> it was a pretty crazy night. Um, but as the, as one of them described, we don't have any more members, but we have guests. Okay. Fair <laughs> enough. I'll accept but that. You're welcome. You're welcome to the table anytime. Thank you. I would, <laughs> I would take that invitation and run. <laughs> Great. Um, I just have to say that, um, to see you here in, before me today, I know it's morning for you. It's afternoon for me. Uh, you've always felt like you've been part of the family because 
you were always part of our dinner time growing up in Nova Scotia. <laughs> so there was always that. Nancy Regan, five o'clock. You were always there um, when my parents were putting out our, our dinner on the table. So you, you've always been in our family. And here we are now. That's so special. I never get tired of hearing that. And I will say that I have literally heard that same sort of phrase thousands of times in my life and particularly in my career, but I still hear it years after leaving my daily job in TV. Everywhere I went in the three maritime provinces on the East Coast of Canada, people would say, oh, we feel like we know you because you have dinner with us every night. And when you think about it, that's a really beautiful privilege. So basically, I could go to a party anywhere on the East Coast of Canada and feel instantly comfortable because people felt like they knew me. And Definitely. that, you know, that sense of hospitality and um, the openness of people's hearts toward me really felt like a, a really special privilege. Yeah, definitely. And I was speaking to a friend of mine uh, in Halifax, actually, last night on FaceTime. And I said, oh, um, I've got Nancy Regan tomorrow. And uh, she was like, I just, I just, it just blows my mind because she's always been like someone that you feel you know. And she's always been like that family member. Uh, that's, so that's, that's really sweet. And it's, it's encouraging to me because what I always wanted to do when I was on television was really make a connection to the viewer. And although, you know, as I talk about in my book, I, I had a lot of insecurity and lack of confidence then, but I, I still believe that I let a uh, part of myself truly be seen. Although I had, you know, some, some parts of me that I was hiding because I thought they were inadequate. Uh, but that's part of our life journey, isn't it? Definitely. And um, yeah, so I'm going to touch on that actually, because your book was very interesting and a bit of a surprise, to be honest, because you did come across as, as very professional and, and secure and uh, confident. You were just, you were just always that 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 person that was just you could just look up to all the time, and there were a few instances that um, came through in your personal life that were always on the news as well, and you were just a brave face through all of that, and so people just looked up to you for all those reasons. But you're very open and honest in your book that you've released, which is a very very good read, uh, showing off or showing up. And can you tell us the difference? Yeah, it's, um, I really appreciate you saying that. I, it took a lot of vulnerability to release this book into the world. And I had been private for a, a long time. And so, you know, as most authors, I went through that, uh, uh, sort of tumultuous journey, like a roller coaster of who am I to write a book? Why would anyone want to read <laughs> what I've written? And yet feeling this purpose-driven um, engine beneath that. And, and in the end, I realized that exactly what you said is the reason why it was important for me to put this book into the world. Because people looked at me and said, wow, she's so confident. She's got it all together. Definitely. And one day while writing the book, I just realize. It's like I had this knowing all of a sudden that settled me down. This is why I'm supposed to put this out into the world because I want people to read it and say, oh, I thought she had the world by the tail. I thought she was totally confident. And yet she was going through exactly what I've gone through in my life. And so, and yet here she was interviewing Oprah on Oprah's set in Chicago Definitely. and we have something in common. And so I, I really wanted people to understand that that's just the human condition. And that's probably been by my biggest learning through offering this book to readers that they've come back to me saying, Oh my God, you're telling my story. It's like you looked inside my head and heart and you're telling my story. So the more times I've heard that, which is, I don't know, it must be up to a thousand by now. <laughs> I, I feel that sense of 
uh, important contribution that, yeah, I was supposed to do this for exactly that reason, to help other people feel less alone in that experience, but also to help me and yeah. to help me really understand this is not just my experience. This is the human condition. You know, we go around wearing a mask of, yes, everything's perfect. And really underneath that feeling anything but. And that's where my answer, my answers are always long, <laughs> Kevin, and they're circuitous. <laughs> I'm getting to your question. Here it is. From showing off to showing up means this. Showing off in my thinking is living your life according to other people's expectations, looking for praise, looking for the good opinion of others. And that's a performance kind of mindset. Whereas showing up is here I am. This is the real me. And that includes an element of take me or leave me. You know, I can, I can handle you not liking me. Which like is why that. the first the first line in the book is you may hate this book, it's true. which is about possibility and permission. That's right. And that's what gives the book wings is that I was willing to write it without worrying about other people's judgment. And instead of focusing on the performance, focusing on the contribution. And and did you feel worried at all when you released the book? Did you think, oh my gosh, how are people gonna perceive me? Are they gonna think of me differently? Or did you have that kind of empowerment? Oh, no. I'll answer the first part of your question. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> I was, I went into an anxiety spiral the day it went to the printer because it was out of my hands. And as a, a recovering perfectionist who's recovering better some days than others, I really felt this anxiety of, oh my God, what have I done? Like I'm revealing myself to the world. I felt a little bit like I was standing naked in the middle of, uh, you know, the grocery store and feeling, why would I do this? I, I really went into this questioning of, oh my gosh, have I done the right thing or have I made a huge mistake? And it, it really was when people started reading it and giving me feedback that that anxiety completely dissipated. Like it was like taking the air out of a balloon and I relaxed into it because I realized, yeah, I, okay. I was right. When my heart told me I was supposed to be doing this, when my heart and soul told me this was something I was supposed to put out into the world. Um, and my brain was going, what really? <laughs> I listened to my heart and soul. And finally, when I was getting feedback from readers, I realized, yeah, you know what? My heart and soul, of course, were right. Definitely. And I love that you are so honest about so many topics as well. Yeah, that was scary. But it uh, it had a purpose, like I say, and and at the same time, it, there's a paradox because I I say clearly in the book, when you are looking into your own shadow, the parts of yourself that you don't like to figure out why and what it is you don't accept about yourself, you want to look at old traumas and you want to have someone you can open up to and be vulnerable with. But you don't want to be vulnerable with just anyone. You've got to make sure that it's a it's a safe audience and right. someone who will hold you, you know, in a in a nest or in a vault, basically, so that you're protected. And yet here I was being vulnerable in a book, just putting it out into the world. And I I will say the only reason I felt I could do that was because I had done the work of sharing with people very close to me and done the work of my personal uh, excavation, basically. So and you were I ready felt for that. Solid. Yeah, yeah, I felt solid in who I was and what I had been through. You had and that I, foundation. Yeah, I felt like, yeah, that's exactly it. I felt like I had a foundation to work from. Right. So the one thing that I, I loved about the book, one thing, because there's several... Uh, but is your referral to Gus. Stay with us. We'll be right back. 
Join us each week on the Well Beyond Medicine podcast as we explore the 80% of child health impacts that occur outside the doctor's office. Listen and subscribe at NemoursWellBeyond.org, where you'll hear pediatric experts, researchers, and policymakers from around the world discussing ways they are revolutionizing children's health. I'm your host, Carol Vassar. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Gus. Gus is is my best friend and my worst enemy. Exactly. I love that. So, do you want to just maybe explain Gus a little bit? I will. I'll, I'll actually start from how he was born. To tell you the truth, I would love that because uh, I did a an interview with a podcast conversation, really, with Elizabeth Gilbert, who is the author of Eat, Pray, Love, most famously. And also another book, which is one of my favorite in the world, called Big Magic. And I interviewed her in New York City for my old podcast, The Soul Booth. And uh, that was a very important conversation, which I write about in the book, because she talked about paradox in a way in that conversation that really cracked something open for me in terms of understanding myself as more than one thing, you know, none of us is just one thing. No. All of us is a paradox. And and I'm not all good or bad. I'm not just a disorganized, <laughs> messy, ADHD, you know, human. I'm also someone who's highly creative and compassionate and loving. And all those things can coexist. And if I can accept that, I can accept myself. And so that helped me a lot. But when Elizabeth Gilbert came to Halifax, we I was involved with a production team that brought her here to speak, and she did this day-long uh, workshop, and one of the things she talked about was fear and how, you know, she talked about how fear lives in our reptilian brain, and she encouraged us to give a name to our fear, or actually more than that, just personify it by writing a letter to ourselves from our fear. I love that. And when I first heard her saying it from the stage, I was, I went into doubt. I was like, yeah, like I believe in the power of free writing. A lot of things have surfaced for me by simply getting still and quiet and putting pen to the paper and allowing it to move. And sometimes you look at what you've written and go, what? This and you share some me? of that in the book as well, which yeah, I, love. I yeah. And I didn't even know that I felt that way. Well, she gave us an exercise like that, that day and told us to write a letter from our fear. And it was revelatory to me. It, it again, was something that cracked me open. And so it made me think of the idea of not just personifying my fear, but giving it a name and a, and a, a, a personality. So for me, I created this alligator because of the reptilian brain, an alligator named Gus. And Gus stands for give up stupid I love because that. that was the voice nattering away in my head. So often when I was presenting this confident, projecting this confident air on TV, I had this voice running in my head going, oh, you made another mistake. And oh, you shouldn't even have this job. What are you doing here? Why would you say that? And it was louder than those voices that I had in my earpiece you know, of the of director and the producer and the, and so on. And so I realized that so much of that was fear-based and fear of, of judgment of other people, fear of looking stupid, fear of being seen by others as not being enough because, you know, I didn't think I was enough. That was my deep, dark secret. I thought I was not enough. Right. And yet the more people shone a spotlight on me, You'd think that would make me feel better, but it only made me feel better in small doses because as soon as the spotlight was off, it's not sustainable. It's like a drug. You know, it makes you feel better when you're warm in the spotlight, but when the spotlight's gone, you go right back to, I'm not enough. And so in some ways, the more people make a big deal about you, if you really have a sense of insecurity and inadequacy, in my experience, 
the worse you feel because you feel like such an imposter. Right. So that was my experience. And that's why Gus is my personification of my fear. And the more, as you know, I learned in the book, the it's all about, it's all about befriending my fear, not about treating him as an enemy. So is, and, Gus, and, is Gus a best friend now? Like I say, a best <laughs> friend and a worst enemy. <laughs> I, it's a little bit like my my um, oldest kids are two boys who are 21 months apart. And when they were little, I used to say, people would say, oh, they get along so well. And I said, yeah, 90% of the time. And 10% of the time, they're worst enemies. <laughs> and and that's because it's a practice for me. You know, it's... It, um, it all comes down to the practice of presence. And that's why the last section of my book is called Doorways to Presence, because I am very clear in the book. I am not trying to say to anybody, hey, I've got it all figured out. <laughs> I'm very intentional in saying I am still a big hot mess a lot of the time, but I have this amazing practice of really bringing myself back into the present moment remembering who I am and, and really feeling a whole sense of myself instead of being in fear or thinking about my inadequacies, bringing myself back into a present moment, nothing's wrong. You know, no. when I can really be present, I can be calm. I'm not in anxiety. I'm not in fear. I'm not worrying about the future or ruminating on the past. I'm just here and I'm happy. I love that. And um, reading the book, I it took me back to so many conversations with friends. And it it doesn't have to be women either. I think men can relate to this book so so well. Um, and this is definitely definitely going to be a Christmas um, gift to many of my friends. I think because they'll oh. they'll relate to this so much. Yeah, that touches my heart. I I have to say when I put the book out there, I expected it would be a demographic of women 35 to 65 or something like that. And it's really shocked me, the range of readers. And in, in one week, I've said this before, in one week, I had an 82-year-old man and a 25-year-old woman give me feedback that was almost identical, saying, wow, your book really took me by surprise and it changed the way I look at myself. And I uh, I have to say I was very emotional about that because that's the greatest gift, I think, that an author can get to have people say that their book has landed in a really meaningful way, that it's actually shifted something for them in their understanding of themselves. That is like... That's that's my Christmas gift right there. Yeah, that's amazing. That's that's great feedback. Um, I like the Fancy Nancy nickname. Is that something that has followed you up until now? No, it's <laughs> funny because when you said this week, oh, you you can call me Jet now, and I said okay. Well, then I signed off that note, Fancy. Yeah, because there is a moment in the book that I talk about um, reclaiming. Fancy Nancy, which was a name that I had when I was a little girl. And I actually wasn't very fancy in the traditional sense of the word as a girl, because I was a total tomboy. I was not like the Fancy Nancy book where she wore all feathers and, you know, uh, uh, diamonds or, or uh, sparkly things. I was the opposite of that. And the world sort of told me in various ways through various people that I had to morph into a different type of being in order to be a girl, in order to be a, a woman. I had to walk a certain way. I had to sit a certain way. I had to behave a certain way. I had to look a certain way. And I think the world tells all of us how to be and who to be to some extent. And we mold ourselves according to how the world responds to us. And we move away from who we really are too often. There's a there's an Irish poet who has a beautiful line saying that all childhood is an sorry, all childhood is an emigration from oneself. And for me, 
writing this book was about getting back to who I was before the world told me who and how to be, which is why I am sitting wearing Converse for one thing, Converse sneakers on the cover, but it's also why I'm sitting backwards on a chair. I, you know, we all have friends who we bounce things off of, who we really trust to give us good, uh, um, opinions and judgment in terms of projects we're doing or whatever, uh, good feedback. And I sent uh, my girlfriend, Karen, a few pictures from the proofs of a photo shoot I had done for my book. And she saw this particular picture and she said, oh, I really like that picture. However, I have to admit that I kind of have a thing. I don't really love seeing women sit with their legs open because here I am sitting backwards on a chair with my knees open and my my feet crossed. And I picked up the phone and called her right away. And I said, I want to talk about that. And she said, oh, I'm embarrassed. I even wrote it. She said, I know it's a hangover from being told as a child, girls don't sit like that. That's right. And I was like, bing. That is why this is the right picture for my book. And I, I and so, thought that when I yeah. saw the photo. Yeah. Really? Yeah, I did. Especially when I finished the book. I was like, I totally get why she had this photo as as the cover. Yeah. It was the kind of inside a- scoop of it for me. Sorry to interrupt. The inside scoop is that the chair back also represents uh, a personal boundary. So I'm being totally open, but I'm also holding personal boundary, which we all should. Definitely. Um, And also talking about that, you had a crush on Ken, (laughs) which is quite interesting because uh, I don't know if it's out in Canada now, but it's it's just been released Barbie and Ken today here in the UK. Um, Same. uh, Okay, cool. So I thought I need to bring that up. So did you, you have a crush on Ken? I didn't. He ha- he has no bits. Well, that's true. That <laughs> didn't matter to me at the point. I didn't really get bits at that age. I was but fascinated that's a big with part Barbie. Part of why I liked Barbie because of the romantic. Like I didn't love doll. I didn't like dolls actually as a kid. But there's something about um, Barbie and Ken. Even though I was a tomboy, I the the roots of my sexuality and gender identity. Well, the roots of my sexuality were more clear maybe than my gender identity because I always romanticized about boys. And Ken, yeah, Ken, I guess, was my first crush. <laughs> so did, did your, did your first boyfriend... Regardless of the lack of bits. <laughs> were your first boyfriends blonde? Yes. Ah. Oh, the first boyfriend, I think about him, he could have been like the elementary school <laughs> version of Ken. That's hilarious. <laughs> And he wasn't really my boyfriend, just my crush. <laughs> Unfortunately, he never attained the uh, the lofty uh, title of boyfriend, unfortunately. Uh-huh. His loss. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe his gain. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, you did say this was going to be unfiltered. It is unfiltered. Um, so just going back to that time, um, I just, I wondered if you felt pressure growing up because the family you were brought up in, um, you speak about that in your book, but uh, most Canadians would know the story. So um, your dad was um, the premier of Nova Scotia. Premier, yeah. Your your brother was the speaker of the House of Commons. Eventually, yeah. Yeah. Did you feel... later. Did you feel that you were sort of led to go into politics or did you... (laughs) (laughs) Were you like the independent woman? (laughs) Do you know the expression, you can't lead a horse to water? Exactly. (laughs) You can't lead Nancy to politics. Yeah. Uh, I have been asked many times in my life. And in fact, my dad found it frustrating that I wasn't interested in running because he, he always felt that because I had such a profile from television that I, you know, had a really good chance of getting elected. And he would say to me, if good people don't run for politics, where does that leave us? And I always think about that now, because for me, the answer is Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Not to get too political, but <laughs> anyway. That's um, scary. So I was never interested in running for politics. And it is it is funny because when we were kids, you know, I was always 
uh, oh, you're Jerry Regan's daughter. And then, and so was my brother Jeff and my other siblings. And then Jeff eventually graduated when I became a television broadcaster. Jeff had to then listen to people say, oh, you're Nancy Regan's brother. <laughs> And eventually that came round when he became uh, a member of parliament and then eventually the speaker of the House of Commons. All of a sudden, I was no longer on TV and <laughs> I became Jeff Regan's sister, which is kind of a fun evolution. That is a great evolution. And um, you wanted to be an English teacher. Was that right? That was my plan. <laughs> I don't know how I ended up in television. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great story, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Which you talk about was, as well. It was kind of a, a fluke in a way. Um, and I, I had an opportunity to be on television because I was, I had been asked to host a um, um, fashion show, a multicultural fashion show in Halifax. And uh, that's because I had profile of my own, even though I was only 20 at the time, but I had somehow, <laughs> now I don't want anyone to tune out because I say <laughs> this, I had somehow gotten myself into uh, being in a beauty pageant, which I have a lot of feelings about now, not all good, most of them not good, but it did teach me a lot. And it was a weird a route into it. I went in kicking and screaming, but a friend of mine was uh, organizing it. And I was, we were certain that this other young woman was going to win. And it was just a very small Miss Bedford competition. <laughs> and all of a sudden I somehow uh, won and I went off to the Miss Nova Scotia pageant, which I thought was ridiculous. I was still, you know, feeling my tomboy self and somehow I won that. And the next thing you knew, I was at the Miss Canada pageant, which I did not win. And that's something I write about, uh, I think, in a pretty open way. But because I had done that, I ended up having this opportunity on television and it was just a small snippet but I got a lot of feedback from people saying, oh, you're so natural. You're so good on camera, which is hilarious considering, you know, I was actually pretty nervous, but I was a good actor. And that was the secret to me being on TV and making people feel like I was comfortable, that I actually was a much better actor than anyone knew. <laughs> and I was acting the part of someone who was comfortable, not only on TV, but I was acting the part of someone who was comfortable in my life. And that's what led me eventually to taking a hard look and saying, okay, I'm acting my way through life. And it, as you know, it was a, it was a guy in a bar who was having sort of a heart to heart with me who said, I see you in a way. He said, wow, you're an amazing pretender. You're an excellent faker is what he said. And I was like, I felt like he pushed me back and he didn't mean it in a mean way, but he could see me and he could see that I was not what I was presenting. And it, he was right. And I all of a sudden went, oh my gosh, I am an excellent faker and I am faking so much of my life. And that's what led to this book. Sure. And that's a great part. Have of you the ever book felt well. that? You're very, you're very open and authentic. Have you gone through that? Definitely. Multiple times. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I read the book and I was like, I related to so many, to, almost, to pretty much every chapter. Oh, I wow, could, re I could relate awesome. to, to things in my life. Yeah. And that's why I think yeah. people are going to read that book. And uh, I think when you pick it up, you're not expecting um, for it to be so honest. And mm -hmm. when you get into like the nitty gritty details and and just sort of like think, oh, wow, she's, she's, she's just like us. She's a normal person. She, she presented in a different way. Like we all do with some people in our lives. Right. Yeah. And um, right. that's the interesting bit. Yeah, that is, that's a beautiful thing that I learned too, that I would have thought before I wrote this book that in order to appeal to a broad audience, you have to write in a broad way. But the opposite is the case. The more personal you get, and I think this is true in doing a podcast, for instance, but the more personal you get about yourself, 
actually, the more it resonates for others, the more they can see themselves in it. That's kind of a bizarre truth, but I've seen it over and over again. And I've talked to other authors about it and they say, oh yeah, you've got to, you've really got to get personal in order for it to land. And another way I see that, Kevin, and this does go to hosting a podcast, the more something comes from a level of heart and soul, the more it can land in heart and soul for others. Definitely. Whereas if you're coming from an intellectual or strategic place, that's the only place it can land for others. It's not going to, it's not going to have a heart based effect if it's coming from your strategy or intellect. Definitely. And that's showing off to showing up. Right on, right on. <laughs> it instead definitely of showing is. off, you're instead of performing, you're really contributing by being your truest self and not worrying about how other people are going to accept you, but really worrying more about what you're giving to the world. You know, how are you contributing? That's right. And um, so that comes to one of my questions: uh, social media, showing off or showing up, or can it be a <laughs> bit of both? Oh, I think, I think for a lot of people, it lands in the showing off category. Mm -hmm. I think so much about social media is the mask that shows people how, look how great my life is. Definitely. Look how well my kids are doing. Look how, which by extent, by extension means look how well I'm doing because I've raised them well. These are my little satellites in the world. <laughs> They're my little ambassadors that show how, how okay I am. When for most of us, if we dig beneath that and, and do that excavation, the real feeling underneath is I'm not enough. And it's so important for me to constantly be proving to the world how enough I am. Definitely. I, I really, when I'm posting something on social media, I go through this checklist and I, I heard, um, I was listening to Michelle Obama's book recently and I heard her say the same thing. And I thought, yeah, that is exactly what I do. I try to go through a filter of why am I posting this? Right. Is it showing off or showing up? Am I performing or contributing? And it's the advice I give people when I work with them in terms of presentation training as a coach. It's that flipping that switch, in my experience, helps people so much in terms of feeling comfortable going on stage. If they can get out of the mindset of how are people going to judge me, which is how am I going to perform, and think instead of what am I here to share? What am I here to give? How can I edify this audience? How can I, you know, give them something that they can take away? Then that sense of contribution helps you get out of your own way and really show up. And that's when you can be present on stage. And, you know, what I say to my clients is that I don't want you to present on stage. I want you to present I want I you that. to go up there and be present. And that's the secret to stage presence, which so many people think of as a mysterious thing. What is stage presence? How do you, how do you cultivate it? It's about being present and comfortable enough to truly be present on stage without that Gus or whoever it is for you, nattering away and distracting right. you from being in the moment. That's right. So if you think back to your famous haircut when you were on, on TV, imagine how different that would have been for you with social media. Oh, because you talk about in the book. Think about it. <laughs> but you, you, you talk about in the book how um, the poor receptionist was getting all the phone calls. Um, imagine if you had social media and how, so people, this happens to people every day right now. And imagine how they have to deal with that. Yeah. I really don't. I, I know if I think of my 25 year old self when I was starting out and if I had had social media to contend with, I, it took me a long time to understand that you're never going to get everyone to like you. Like in, in TV, if, if 50% of the people like you, that's great. And, and if I could see that reflected in, you know, I wanted everyone to like me. It was so important to me. 
if I could see reflected in social media that 50% of the people maybe didn't like me, that would have completely uh, pulled the rug out from under me because I didn't have the foundation of really knowing and accepting myself or the foundation of, of knowing that it didn't matter. Those people, you know, it's like what other people think of you is really none of your business. I love that expression. I love that as well. Right. And I would not have had the true underpinning of confidence to be able to put up with that. So I really admire younger people who are in the media now who have to put up with that. And I I don't know how they do it. I think I would just have to say, uh, talk to the hand. I'm not looking. (laughs) I can't, I can't. It's like as an actor saying, I'm not going to read my own reviews because if you believe the good reviews, you have to believe the bad reviews too. So no, thank you. Yeah. (laughs) No reviews. It just makes me think of um, several people that I've met recently and they've said, um, so they've been high profile and I've said, oh, uh, or they've said, reach out to me and, and we'll communicate. And I say, oh, do you check your own messages or do you have somebody that I should refer to? And some, it's sort of 50, 50 right now where people say, oh, oh no, I don't. And then other people say, I would never have anybody else look after my, my personal messages. So it is 50, 50 mm-hmm. right now. Yeah. For the record, I do. Oh, now I'm putting it out there. I do read my own messages, but um, for the most part, but I have definitely considered uh, if I, if I decide when my audio book comes out in August, uh, flag on the play there, my audio book's coming out in August. Um, I have a publicity company that would like to work with me to edit it out in a you know, more um, considerable way in Canada, the U S and the UK, especially. Sure. And I, in that case, will probably have them do some of my, my fielding. Uh, but that's, yeah, we'll see. That's all an interesting new horizon. It is. I was just going to ask um, when you left CTV, which was probably the height of your career, you then got divorced hmm. soon after. I, yeah. So I divorced like, CTV and then I divorced my then husband. Whoa. You did. So um, it was a lot. The, one of the, the um, sentences in your book was, I was unlovable. Mm. So how did you change that? Because you certainly don't come across as unlovable now. You're one of the most lovable oh. people I've met. Oh, you're wonderful. And I, I think I would have a lot of people who who would say they knew me then and they thought me, I was lovable then. And I explain in the book what I mean by that. It was this it was this moment in a yoga retreat and I was in a meditation and it was one of those I described having just a knowing sometimes this just happens where it's like something falls through me and I go, oh, and I just know it. And in that moment, I was like, oh, it wasn't his fault. It was my fault. I was unlovable. And and I go on to explain, I mean that I was not able to be loved because I did not feel lovable. I didn't feel worthy of love. I didn't love myself. And people... I think often cringe at that expression. Like I always say self-love is an interesting phrase because I know it used to make my skin crawl. Like, Oh, what is, what is that even about? And when I encountered the work of Louise Hay, which was all about, you know, helping people really embrace all parts of themselves and, and love themselves, which goes back to the work of Carl Jung, you know, looking into your shadow self uh, you know, what is it that drives you crazy about other people? And then realizing that, oh, that's because it triggers something that I don't like about myself. And when I first heard that in, in Psych 101 in university, I was like, no, that is not true. <laughs> <laughs> what I don't like about other people has nothing to do with me. Uh, but of course it does. And so I, uh, it started me on the journey of understanding I really 
didn't believe I was worthy of love because I saw so much that was wrong with myself. And it was like, I had a uh, confirmation bias. You know, that's an expression they use for scientists when you're doing an experiment. And if you have conf confirmation bias, it's like you see what you're looking for. And, and so that can throw you off. And I was always looking for evidence that I was not worthy of love. I, I was always looking for evidence that there was something wrong with me or that, you know, I was imperfect. And instead of seeing the good in myself, it was a very glass half empty or Nancy half empty approach to life. And I feel very differently now. I really feel like um, that paradox that I talked about that Liz Gilbert helped me understand so much in that one conversation in New York I really feel now that I see myself as a whole person, which encompasses the good, the bad, and the ugly, and, and the beautiful, frankly. Definitely. And, the, the other quote that I love is, um, pra practice makes imperfect. Yes. And so I've written that. I've highlighted that in the book, actually. That's one of my oh, favorite Oh, thank quotes. you so much. Practice for me has made imperfect. It's helped. Practice in presence has helped me feel comfortable being imperfect and saying, yes, of course I'm imperfect. We're all imperfect. And we're all going around the world feeling we need to hide the fact that we're imperfect. You know, when I was a teenager, my biggest secret that I had to keep from the world was that I was actually a total dork. <laughs> and I didn't want anyone to know that. And that became true when I was on TV projecting this, oh, here I am, a television professional, where inside I was like, I'm really actually a total dork and I don't want anyone to know this. Uh, so yeah, that's my, that's my secret. And as you know, one of the most vulnerable things I did in my book is to include my own poetry. I love that. And it's very simple. I always feel like I've got to say, say to people, my poetry is as if my grade four self wrote it. But I love the fact that because it does come from the heart and soul, it tends to land there in other people. And I, I was going to ask you if I could read this one short poem because I it ties in exactly to what you just asked me. And it, it goes like this. Don't love me because I'm special. Don't love what I achieve. Gold stars cause scars and forge the need to please. Love me for who I am in my deepest, darkest heart. A fearful fraud, simply flawed, trying to be smart. See that and see my light, the beauty of my soul. Just like you, trying to get through this journey back to whole. Love that. That kind of says it all for me. And it is, it's the, the beautiful thing for me is that it's resonated with a lot of people and one person so much that she reached out to me. I didn't know who she was or where she was from. And she reached out to say that she, this makes me emotional. <laughs> she got a tattoo on her arm of a star because of my line, goals, gold stars cause scars or forge, yeah, forge scars. Wow. Anyway, and and she always wanted to remind herself that I'm not going around in my life looking for gold stars. I'm just going to be present in my life and think about what I'm bringing to others and how I can be of service rather than how I can be the center of attention and be seen as, oh, isn't she great? I love that. That's a great story. Thank you so much. I love that. And uh, that kind of ties into your love of stones on the beach, because I, too, come home anytime I I'm at the seafront with stones. <laughs> I'll come back from, from Nova Scotia with stones in my suitcase when I'm flying into London. Oh, my gosh. I Kevin, do. You and I were meant to be friends. Definitely. You know, it's like we we have been waiting to be friends our whole lives. And I love, I have to give a tip of the hat to your fabulous mother from Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, <laughs> because she reached out to me and we've known each other for years, sort of at a distance and have followed each other on Facebook. And I just think she's wonderful. But she reached out to say, 
I would love you to sign a book for, I bought a book of yours and I want you to sign it so I can send it to my son who lives in the UK. And so when she came to Halifax, we got together so I could sign the book and we got into this great chat and she told me more about you and your partner. And I said, oh, (laughs) that sounds like a great story for the Canadian Love Map podcast. And You know, isn't it funny how the universe works to bring us together and how people come into your life who you then realize, oh, yeah, this is all supposed to happen. Definitely. perfect. I still have the selfie that you guys took um, with the book. Oh, that's (laughs) And maybe I'll post that. Yeah. Oh, I'd love it. I love that, too. Um, Yeah. Uh, But tell us, maybe let's finish off with um, what you're doing now. So you have the Canadian love map. And what season are you in now? I think we're going into our seventh season. It might be our eighth, but we're taking uh, a month off at the moment just to regroup everybody, have a little break, which has been wonderful for me because with my book journey, I've sort of been running on a treadmill for the past year and a half. And it's a wonderful time for me to sort of step back and say, okay, just breathe, just be you know, do, do as I say, (laughs) not as I do. I've been, I haven't been present enough lately. And so it's really a chance for me to get grounded and really get ready for um, promoting my audiobook, which I'm excited about getting back into the Canadian love map, which is such a joy for me, Kevin, you know, we tell stories of love of all kinds and, and it's not just romance like yours, but also, uh, stories of really meaningful friendships like yours with the golden girls and intergenerational love stories and, and people who are engaged in passion projects where they are sharing light with the world, you know, spreading love. So it's, it's really a broad mandate and, I love it so much. I can't tell you every time I'm in the middle of recording a conversation for the Love Map podcast, I have this sense of, oh, I'm so lucky to be doing this. I'm so fortunate. It is such a positive thing. Um, When it was first introduced to me, which honestly was a few months before my own interview, um, I was recovering from surgery and I had to spend some time every evening um, kind of just relaxing. And that's what was my, I would, that was my go-to was the Canadian love map. And, um, I looked forward to that every evening. So I went through season after season and I just loved, I loved, um, (laughs) every story. It was, it was just wonderful. I loved it so much. And then to be a guest on, on the podcast was just, was such a great experience. Oh, it's such a privilege for me. It's, it's not unlike the privilege I talk about when I was on TV and people would just welcome me into their homes because they felt they knew me. It is the same kind of privilege because I approach it with an open heart and they respond. My guests almost always respond with this beautiful openness like you and Nick did. And I I also love it when guests of mine then meet each other as in the case of you and Christina and Dale. (laughs) We did. We just spent, um, we spent a few days together in London. They were over here. She was on tour um, I showed them London. We had a great time. They came over. We had dinner. We sent you some selfies. Oh, uh, which it was made just me great. so joyful. I, th- I really think they have a, a, a wonderful relationship. They do. It's it's great. They were great guests on the Love Map as well. Oh, weren't they fun? I, I know. I'm lucky. I get to do this. <laughs> you are lucky. And you're going to feel that, I think, with every conversation you have. I hope so. I, I have so far. I have, I definitely have a connection with everybody that I've spoken to so far. And um, I'm really excited to share um, every guest that I have because they're all very exciting and all very well, different. Well, when you get to be number one at the top of the Apple charts, I think you should fly us all over to the UK and we should have a party with the Golden Girls. <laughs> that sounds amazing. In fact, I'll make that happen. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Nancy. Oh, you know what? I have enjoyed this so thoroughly and I really feel honored that you asked me. I was I was tickled pink. So I just want to say thank you so, so much. And thanks I, for doing this because you'll bring a lot of light into the world by doing this podcast and sharing these conversations and demonstrating to people how to live 
with an open heart and a lack of filter. Definitely. Showing up. I'm, I'm showing up every day. I promise. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for how you show up in the world, Jet. Seriously. I'm going to end it with find joy, stay safe, and be love. Oh, love it. That's what I say to my kids. It's what I say to my best friends. And that's what I'm saying to you today. Find Lovely. joy, stay safe, be love. Love that. Thanks a lot, Nancy. Ciao, baby. Bye-bye.